Dr. Ken Winters is the director of the Center for Adolescent Substance Abuse Research at the University of Minnesota. He has done extensive research on the adolescent developing brain's vulnerability to substance abuse. At a recent conference in Suffolk County, excuse the pun, he let us pick his brain on some of his findings. How is substance abuse and addiction different in the developing brain of an adolescent than it is for a fully developed brain of an adult? You know, the, the problems related to abuse and dependence that come from using substances by teenagers can actually look very similar in some ways as they do in adults. But here are some key differences. Probably one is that the onset of getting a problem, whether it's abuse level or dependence for a teenager, is shorter than most adults. So there's this shorter time window from the point of somebody starts to use and then develops abuse or dependence for a teenager than you would see with adults. The other thing that happens is um, you won't see a lot of problems in a teenager because uh, the kinds of life they're leading. They don't have as many responsibilities. Um, drugs don't get in the way of somebody's daily activities as much when you don't have to work full time. You don't have to be responsible for other adults like parents do. You don't have a full-time job. So unfortunately, you know, the lifestyle of a teenager, I mean, you're, you're supposed to be serious with school and serious with your activities, but the lifestyle tends to, I think, allow youngsters to be able to use and, and won't see that it has an effect. So thus, it can be more of a hidden problem. And, and with, with the fact that it's hidden, the fact that you don't see as many um, observable problems or dramatic problems, you then get the clinical difficulty of many teenagers and parents don't think that there's a problem. Um, you know, it's tough to convince people, hey, you might be on a path that's uh, leading to addiction. You know, when you don't see the dramatic um, uh, problems arise, you, you can imagine then you have a difficulty in convincing individuals to get help or to stop. Dr. Winters, can you explain the concept of short-term impulse versus long-term consequences in a developing brain? I think the most important principle learned from uh, this neuroscience about brain development is that the, the way the teen brain is developing, it looks as if it means the, the teenager is, is very biased towards short-term rewards. So their incentive um, is tend, uh, to, for behavior tends to be based around, well, what's pleasurable, what's rewarding at the given moment, as opposed to considering negative consequences, whether it's short-term or long-term. So you get, you know, teenagers in certain situations, they're going to just see things sort of for what is the fun aspect of it and not consider what could be the downside. How did you get started in this field of study? I got involved in a research project in the uh, early 80s that studied adolescent drug abuse. But, you know, as science has advanced, we've realized we've got to try to inform our work with what else is going on with emerging knowledge. So about, you know, 20 years ago, we started to learn from uh, neuroscientists about the how, how the brain can get hijacked by drugs and how that can lead to addiction. Well, that interested us because we figured that was probably also relevant to teenagers. And then even more recently, there's been this uh, interesting uh, brain development neuroscience and seeing what the, the impact uh, of a developing brain might have on both decision making as well as on vulnerability to drugs, we realized uh, we need to see how we can put that into our work. And our work is trying to convince um, communities parents and teenagers to make safe decisions, uh, consider the harmful consequences of drugs, and if you start using to stop and wait until at least you're you know, of legal age and you can use alcohol, um, uh, presumably in a healthy manner. Could you explain to us the theory of second thought? You know, one of the biggest principles from this new science is that uh, the part of the brain that helps you, you know, pause and reflect um, or engage in second thought is not working as strong as the other parts of the brain that are telling you go for it. But it doesn't mean a teenager can't pause and reflect and can't resist impulses. The, the mechanism and the maturity and the cognitive skill is there. The problem is the persuasion by context and other factors tend to overpower uh, the self-control capabilities. So we tell teenagers and parents um, this skill is teachable. This skill is well within the uh, repertoire of an individual. Um, but you have to learn to use it. And one of the keys is learning teenagers, teaching teenagers, to use it when the, the uh, situation is at risk not to, to show uh, good self-control. This is when with peers, when you're out having fun, when there's a lot of emotion, uh, when there's a lot of arousal. Um, the, the teenager is going to be persuaded to move towards sort of the you know, impulsive direction. But it doesn't mean a teenager can't pause and reflect 
and think about what are the options. So parents need to get involved in that skill building. I think schools need to do more of it, and surely it's something you can teach teenagers. What are some of the assets for using the teen-friendly approach? You know, we, we hope that prevention and treatment people can take some of this new science and infuse it in their programs. And I think it's uh, captivating for teenagers to learn about the science of, of addiction, including the uh, science of brain development. Um, it's new knowledge. It's science. It tells the teenager about him or herself. These are all things that engage teenagers. So instead of just focusing on here, here's drugs, here's why they're bad, here's the risk and factors that can lead to it, which to some degree is not all that captivating for teenagers and might not get the engagement you like. We think it's uh, very relevant to bring in some of the science. Can you discuss for a moment the teen intervene curriculum? You know, we've, uh, in our work in uh, trying to figure out how to help systems deal with drug abuse, we saw there was a gap um, out there in the health sector, and that is uh, an intervention, short type intervention for teenagers before they've developed a dependence problem in the hopes that there'd be interest in changing the trajectory of the teenage drug use and if it was effective you could prevent the escalation towards dependence. So we developed a brief intervention um, that uh, is three sessions and it's a one-on-one -on -one type of counseling and two sessions is the counselor with a teenager and one is uh, counseling with a parent um, and it's all organized around the notion of getting the teenager and the parent to be more alert to the possible problem that's emerging, to um, try to build more assets in their life uh, so they don't feel like they need to use drugs to, to serve certain value, to have a function for him or her, um, and to um, reinforce the importance of, you know, uh, health is, is an issue that both the teenager and the parent need to give a higher priority to. So it's... Um, uh, a model that uh, we, we think has some value out there. It's, it's not something that costs a lot of money because it's not a you know, high-end specialized treatment. Um, and it's something that can be taught uh, to a wide range of professionals. What would be your advice to parents addressing their teens on drugs? In fact, it's great uh, to learn about what and how to talk to your youngster about drugs at the various ages. Now parents have information scientific-based information, and a great resource to go to. And I encourage people to go to uh, drugfree.org because they actually provide guidance based on age as well as based on perhaps what problems are already emerging with your youngster, how to handle it, what to do, what to watch out for. But the bottom line with um, any parent who has a youngster before the drug-using years is already start to talk and remind the teenager, well, wait, the preteen, that you're going to continue to talk about it. And it's not just a one-time discussion. And you're going to continue to talk about it, even though the teenager might not like it at that time. But um, you know, it's going to be part of our culture. Tommy and Sally, we're going to be always discussing your health as well as uh, our continuing on through, through your teenage years.